is a legal term called double jeopardy, which means a person cannot be convicted of the same crime twice. In our lesson today, Paul provides us with one of the most important doctrine, and that is the doctrine of salvation. And that means that because Jesus paid the price or suffered the consequences for our sins, if we believe in him, we don't have to suffer the wrath of God for ourselves. Otherwise, that would be double jeopardy. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Welcome to JCC Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, August 1st, 2021. The title of this International Sunday School Lesson and Board's Commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School Commentary is Salvation for All Who Believe. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Before we get into the word, let's start with a little prayer. Father, we ask that you be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your son dying on a cross for our sins, Lord. Lord, we, we didn't deserve your salvation. We couldn't earn your salvation, but because of your grace and mercy, you sent your son to die in our place for our sins. So we thank you, we love you, and we honor you. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. So the unifying topic of our lesson is seeking confidence. Our scripture will be coming from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. And our main thought will be Romans chapter 10, verse 13, which says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the aim of our lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will identify several Old Testament passages that Paul used to make his argument, explain the dangers of isolating key verses from his text, and last but not least, create a personal plan to better support the spreading of the gospel through the use of our time, our talents, as well as our treasure. Now, as we do each week, we'll start off with a little bit of background. This week, we're moving to uh, the ninth lesson in our summer quarter, in the unit theme, Faith and Salvation. Over the past four weeks, we've been in, in the book of Romans and we know who is written by the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Church of Rome while he was on his third missionary trip because he had heard about their faithfulness throughout the, the different nations. So he wrote to them while he was in the city of Corinth. In this Apostle, Paul clearly sets forth the foundation of our Christian faith. And that is, Jesus died to forgive our sins. Therefore, we're made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ, which means we have a new life and a new relationship with God. Now, the primary theme that runs through Paul's letter to the Romans is the revelation of God's righteousness in his plan for salvation. And this is what the Bible calls the gospel. One of the key verses in Romans, we'll find in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believe, first the Jews and then the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith. See, Paul shows us how, uh, as human beings, we lack God's righteousness because of our sin, yet we receive his righteousness, we receive his justification by faith alone. And this is where our lesson picks up today in Romans chapter 10, verse five, which says, for Moses write that the law's way of making a person right with God's requires obedience to all its commands. Now we know Moses went up to the mountain and received the 10 commandments from God. When he came back, he told the people that they must follow the law if they wish to be in right standing or have righteousness in the eyes of God. He told the people that this is what God expects of you. The problem is no one can keep those laws. So it was like the laws were like the mirror so you can look at and see what, you're, what you've done wrong. 
The Bible tells us that we all fall short. So when they would break one of these laws, they would have to go ask for forgiveness. And there was um, ways of atonement through um, birds and, and bulls and, and goats and sheep. Um, this is way of atoning for their sins because they broke the law because no one could keep the law. And as we move down to verses six through eight, Paul goes on to say, but faith way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who would go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth. And don't say who would go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. Now you'll notice here verse six start with the word but. It's because Paul contrasts the righteousness that we're seeking through the law with true righteousness that can only be given by God. See, the laws were to show them how they, 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 they couldn't live up to the law. The law was to show them what they'd done wrong so they can know what to repent. And at this time where Paul is writing to, to the Roman church, the Jews had actually over 600 laws that they had to keep. It was impossible for anyone to keep those laws. But that paved the way for Jesus to come in. Jesus is the only human who had not sinned and therefore he's the only one that was able to follow the law. This is why he is the perfect lamb of God. Now in the latter part of verse six and into verse seven, Paul is quoting Moses from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, where Moses tells the Israelites that the command God has given him, them is not too difficult for them to understand, nor is it do, too difficult for them to obey. The message is not locked away in heaven, nor is it thrown into the abyss and beyond their reach. No, the word is near them. In fact, Paul is telling them back then and us right now that Jesus has already come and, and walked among us. He's already descended um, to earth. He died on a cross, descended into the abyss, and then ascended back to earth before ascending into heaven. Therefore, it's no need to ask such questions because Jesus is near us. They don't need to continue looking for the Messiah to come down or come up. Instead, they should understand that he has been near them and that the word of God and faith is right in front of their face and ready if they believe. The word is close at hand. In fact, the, the word is so close that it's on their lips and, and in their hearts. This is what Paul is saying. In other words, if the word was a snake, it would have bitten them because of its proximity to them. Ultimately, Paul is saying that seeking to achieve righteousness on their own, trying to follow the law alone, which is futile in, as far as humans are concerned because we have such a sinful nature, that's the wrong attitude. It's the wrong way to approach a relationship with God. It's not by our might or our power, but through God's spirit that gives us the righteousness that we need. Paul goes on to describe a righteousness that's based on faith and not the law. Specifically, for those who have faith in Christ, what we can achieve because of Christ's life and death on our behalf, we are at a state of permanent righteousness before God. That, that is not something that the law could do for us. It's not about the law, it's about having faith in Christ. See, after telling them that it's, it's through faith alone, he then tells them what they must do as we move down to verses nine and 10, which says, if you open your mouth and declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from, from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it's by opening your mouth, declaring your faith that you are saved. These two verses are the greatest salvation related verses in the entire Bible. But it's important for us today to view them in the context of this chapter. See, Paul relates these verses to verse eight in which he quoted Deuteronomy and said, the word of faith is near, it is on your lips and in your heart. In other words, Paul is saying it's true. The word of faith is, um, uh, is on your lips and near your heart, but you have to have that faith in Christ. See, remember, Paul is talking to the Jews here. 
Paul is explicitly describing what the Jewish people of his day should welcome into their mouths and into their heart. He writes that instead of seeking righteousness by following the law, they should confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Messiah. Also, they should believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if they do this, they will be saved. Verse 10 just further breaks down or clarify verse 9. See, with the heart of a person um, believing, then we're justified and we're declared righteous by God. We're cleared of all charges against us. The faith in Christ that leads to salvation, brothers and sisters, is personal and internal. See, with our mouth, then it becomes by means in which we're able to express our faith in Christ. It's only the saved can truly say with their mouth what happened in their heart. They've placed their faith in Jesus. So last week we discussed justification. So this week, let's talk a little bit about salvation, the salvation that we gain through Jesus. Well, in order to understand what salvation is, we, under, we need to understand why we need to be saved. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We have all fell short of God's glorious standards. See, the fall of man happened in the Garden of Eden. Everyone after Adam and Eve were actually born in sin. We were all sinners in need of salvation from the start. So it's not like at some point we begin sinning. No, we were born in sin. On the other hand, God is holy and he's pure. Our sins are way too serious to be ignored by such a holy God. In fact, the wages or the consequences of our sin is death. Is our sin that drives a wedge between us and God. But God loves us so much that through his grace and his mercy, he made a way for us to reconcile with him without defiling himself or changing his way. Our sin still need to be punished. But in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only son so that anyone that believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. Therefore, salvation is to be saved from the wrath or the punishment of God. So instead of receiving condemnation and damnation for our sins, if we believe that Christ took the punishment for our sin, then we are saved and we will spend eternity with the, uh, with the Father. And that, brothers and sisters, is salvation. In John 3, 36, it puts it like this. And anyone who believe in um, God's son has eternal life, but anyone that doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's anger or angry judgment. God chose us. The question is, will we choose him? That, that's the question. If we choose him, we there's a path to salvation. We can choose God by believing that his son died for his sin. Or we can believe our own righteousness and suffer the consequences ourselves instead of taking advantage of the consequences that Jesus already suffered for us. Now, as we move on down to verses 11 through 13, it says, as the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jews and Gentiles are same in, the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call upon him. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now here we find once again in verse 11, Paul is now quoting the Old Testament. This time he's quoting Isaiah 28, 16, which says, Therefore, this is what the sovereign God says. Look. I am placing a foundational stone in Jerusalem for a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build upon. Whoever believes need never to be shaken. See, here we find Paul is saying that Christ is actually this precious cornerstone that God has laid in Zion. And all who believe in this corner, cornerstone, they are on a secure foundation. They will be um, vindicated or blameless in the eyes of God. 
This foundation will hold. It won't fall. They will find themselves standing on the rock. And we can be confident that no, uh, that no one can pluck us out of the hand of Christ. We can be confident that when we put our hope and our faith in Jesus, we won't be put to shame by being refused eternal life. For we, as we trust in God and have faith in God, we can be assured that we will spend eternity with God. Why? Because Jesus is the rock. The word is the rock. Paul goes on to say that salvation is available to anyone. See, the Jews saw the world in two ways or divided into two parts, the Jews and the Gentiles, those who were chosen by God and those who were not. But Paul forcefully says that that is there is absolutely no distinction between the Jews and Gentiles when it comes to salvation. God is not the God of the Jews or, or the Gentiles or the blacks or the white. He's not the God of the poor or the rich. He's not the God of North America or Africa. He's not the God of the Baptist or the Catholic. No, he's the God of all. He's God whether you believe in him or not. The only question is, will you receive salvation or have to endure separation? Whether you will be judged or receive a well done on the day of judgment. Because on the day of judgment, every knee shall bow because he is the Lord or the God of all. He is his God of all, but for those who make him the Lord or the ruler of their lives, they will be saved. Whosoever turns to Christ in faith, seeking salvation, will receive it. Now, here's the other thing. These verses also implies that God is listening to those who call upon him. As a matter of fact, if we look at 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my faith, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sins and restore their land. God listens to us when we pray, when we call out. And even as we were sinners calling out for salvation, he heard us. And because we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus died for our sins, he gave us salvation. Now, as we move down to verses 14 and 15, it says, but then how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can someone go and tell them without being sent? And this is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who brings good news. See, with the understanding that it is the belief in Christ that initiates salvation and leads someone to call upon him, Paul delivers a series of questions aimed at what is required for, of someone to get to the point to call upon Jesus in order to be saved. The questions that, that suggest that in order to believe in Christ, you have to hear about Christ. In order to hear about Christ, someone have to tell you about Christ. And lastly, in order to, for someone to tell you about Christ, they must be sent by Christ. In short, Christ sends, tells us, he sends us to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. But here's the thing. Preaching is not the first step in this chain leading to salvation. Being sent is. Jesus was sent by the Father, and after his death, burial, and resurrection, he told the disciples before his ascending to heaven in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came and told the disciples, I have given, I have been given all the authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure and, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Therefore, the first step in the chain leading to salvation is someone being sent to proclaim the word. Now, to be sent means to be commissioned by a higher authority. It is a divine commission. Proclamation of the gospel requires set um, commission. It is God anointing you to preach as a gift 
from God. That means the gospel um, does not originate with the, the person that's proclaiming the word, but the one who sent the person to proclaim the word. That means we're not to go around and tell people about what we think and how we understand it and our desires and our will. No, we're only to tell the desires of God to, to proclaim the word of God, which is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the son of God. We're to speak the truth about Jesus so they may hear and upon hearing, they may also have faith. And by having faith, they may be saved. See, the gift of preaching is one of the gifts that, that from God that Paul mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, where it says, the gift God gave us were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some preachers and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for the building, of the, uh, building up the body of Christ. Therefore, Christ, uh, the, Paul is saying Christ has sent people, anointed people, ordained people to preach the word so people may hear. And upon their hearing, they may have faith. And if they have faith, they will be saved. Now, as we move on to our last two verses, verses 16 and 17, it says, But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news of Christ. Here we find Paul once again is in the Old Testament, again in the book of Isaiah. This time he's coming from Isaiah 53, verse 1. See, we find that people didn't accept the message of God. That wasn't old, that, that's not new news, it's old news. We find that throughout the history of Israel. Isaiah says the message must be believed in order to be right with God. Is a matter of faith. And we know faith is one of Paul's favorite topics. Listen, brothers and sisters, it is mind-numbing to think of the fact that God sends messengers to give the best news in the entire world that he is ready to pardon any sinner who will receive his offer of grace, of kindness, and of salvation. Not only that, God also has paid a great price for this particular pardon. Yet there are still some who don't want it. Can you imagine? It's almost like the publishing clearinghouse knocking on someone's door saying, you've won $5 million. And that person comes to the door and tell them, hey, get off my porch. I don't want anything you have there. I don't want it. Keep your money. Keep what you have. Yet it was being freely given to them. Well, this is what happens when we don't accept salvation, when we don't believe that Christ died of our sin. Now, while this right here we find is in contrast of verse 15, which tells us how beautiful it, uh, the feet of the messengers who will bring forth the good news. But here we find in verse 16, it says, not everyone will hear the good news. So Paul says it here in verse 17, it says, consequently, faith come by what is heard and what is heard come through the preach word of Jesus Christ. So Paul to, seemed to be, um, talking completely about the evangelistic sequence from verse 16. People need to hear the message before they believe. And thank God for those who have, have, have took the calling and the gift of God to preach the word and actually go out and preach the word. How can they believe if they don't hear? See, we as followers of Christ, brothers, each and every one of us, our, our, our commission. Better yet, we're commanded to spread the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to any and everyone. So they may also be saved um, by the power and the grace of God. God has given us this commission so we can tell somebody and tell anybody. In fact, we can tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That is the gift of salvation. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson for this week. Don't forget to leave us a, a like and or comment or even subscribe to our channel. So until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn towards you and give you peace. Amen. You have a blessed week. Goodbye.